Okay, let's get started tonight. I'm Mark Frazier. I'm a co-director of the India China Institute, and it's it's really a great pleasure uh, to welcome those of you here in person and the uh, many dozens of you online to tonight's talk. Those of you who have, who have heard me speak before know that I sound a little bit different behind this mask. Uh, I am a little bit under the weather with the seasonal cold, but I feel better already with this chance to introduce our speaker tonight, Professor Sylvia Lentner, who is Associate Professor in the School of Information at the University of Michigan and co-founder and director of a very interesting center known as the Center for Ethics, Society, and Computing, which is pronounced ESCAPE because it's ESC, it's the escape key. Uh, and they do a, an amazing amount of interventions and, and work on uh, the, the intersection of, of society and ethics and computing. She is, as many of you know, the author of the award-winning book, Prototype Nation, China and the Contested Promise of Innovation, published with Princeton University Press in 2020. The book received awards from the Society for East Asian Anthropology, as well as the Joseph Levinson Prize from the Association for Asian Studies, which is the award that goes to the best book on modern or contemporary China each year. Uh, five years ago, Sylvia gave a, a talk titled The Promise of Making here at ICI. This was in April of 2018, almost exactly five years ago, drawn from chapters that would become Prototype Nation. And I, I hope we help a little bit with our comments and feedback in making uh, that book the, the, the great work that it was. She was also here a few years before that, even at uh, the politics of spatial, the, the spatial politics of work workshop that we did. Uh, in Brooklyn in 2016. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. One other thing I wanted to point out was that she, with co-authors, has just published an amazing uh, account of, of zero COVID lockdown in Shanghai and looking at the, the labor and data governance. Oh, and her co-author is here in the, in the audience. I just yeah. think I realized. Hi, good to, good to see you, Chan. Um, I would recommend uh, it to all of you, and she may discuss that uh, if there's time uh, in tonight's talk. Uh, she and her collaborators have also earned five National Science Foundation grants since 2013, which I think is amazing. As many of you know, uh, an NSF requires no small amount of labor and data governance uh, when you apply for one, let alone what happens after you get one and all the reporting you have to do. But it's just uh, an amazing amount of, of, of generously funded and, and deservedly funded uh, research on, on her areas of interest. She received her PhD in information and computer sciences from the University of California, Irvine, followed by two concurrent uh, postdoctoral fellowships, one at the Intel Center for Social Computing and the other from Fudan's University, Fudan University's School of Computer Science. Finally, she was one of, if not the only foreign researcher to conduct fieldwork in China during the pandemic and with the freeze on research exchanges arising both from uh, the crackdown on social science research as well as uh, the pandemic restrictions on mobility. We do have someone in the audience tonight who was uh, not a foreign researcher per se, but uh, Nafu, uh, our, our student here in the politics department uh, who also did research during the pandemic uh, and very impressive on, on both counts to, to both of you. Tonight's talk is on the allure of automating China's soil and Goal, and it draws on her recent research in Yunnan province and looking at data-driven agriculture and food production practices. So here in the room and here online, please join me in welcoming Professor Sylvia Lentner tonight. Thank you so much, Mark, for this really kind introduction. It is such a pleasure to be back here, as Mark was saying. Um, many of you have been such uh, tremendous support and interlocutors for my past book, Prototype Nation. And so who knows what will come out of my talk today, maybe another book. <laughs> but it's, it's always my favorite time of the year when I'm out here with the new school. It's uh, such an intellectually stimulating community. So thank you so much for this invitation, Mark, for making it happen. And also thank you to Grace and Anna for all the background work to make my trip possible. Um, yeah, it's such a delight to be back. Um, so today, as Mark uh, was already foreshadowing, I will be drawing from fieldwork I've been conducting in China over the last year and a half. And I'll be talking about something that I've started to call data engines. 
so data engines is something uh, that is empirically grounded uh, based on several different research sites where I've spent time in last year, but it's really an analytical move um, that I used to unpack China's turn towards data-driven governance. And so more specifically, what this meant um, in terms of my ethnographic research, and if I can find my cursor, I can actually move the slides. Hmm. Here it is. Here we go. So uh, I basically will be drawing from three ethnographic research sites. Um, the first one being what might be broadly construed as China's population management during uh, zero COVID, so during the pandemic of the last three years. Uh, research I've conducted at the outskirts of China's big cities, predominantly Shanghai, where there is a range of experiments happening in precision farming. And then third, I spent quite a bit of time in rural parts of China to study something that is now often also referred to as China inwards turn. So this often refers to as both as citizens and politicians attention to China's countryside. Uh, so throughout this talk, I will unpack how data engines as a mode of data driven governance is in many ways an intensification of two phenomena that I've also studied as part of my earlier research in prototype nation. So I will unpack what is happening today is a form of prototyping technological advances through very concrete sites. And I will also zoom in on how data-driven governance heavily relies on happiness labor. So a form of emotional labor that is very common in the tech industry. I'll come back to this later in the talk. So when it comes to data and governance in China, US media discourse has heavily relied on notions such as the surveillance state, the invisible cage and the police state. I'm sure many of you have seen media coverage or publications like the ones here on the screen. And so my underlying aim with this analytical lens of data engine is really to provide a corrective to these often quite sensationalized framings of China as a totalitarian surveillance state, which is often used as an explanatory frame. So often in these writings, it is taken as a given that China is a successfully implemented, all-encompassing, top-down police state uh, that is centrally enabled now by data and artificial intelligence. So these writings often advance what we might call a techno-orientalist idea that China can and should be understood predominantly as an automated machinery of top-down control. And often this is also presented as a serious threat to Western liberal democracies. And often with that sort of assumption, the West and the United States in particular are often presented as holding a kind of exceptional status and as naturally resistant to becoming authoritarian. So with data engines, I really hope to intervene in this broader discursive frame of China as a threatening other, as an inherent surveillance state. And so I will show you throughout this talk today that data engines are a technique of governance that are simultaneously coercive and participatory. This might sound contradictory, um, but that's my very point. And what I aim you really to convince you of in this talk today is that most fundamentally data engines are aimed at transforming the day-to-work, day-to-day work of low-level bureaucrats and of citizens to whom certain processes of data-driven governance are delegated. So I will draw specifically then on two stories um, from my ethnographic, read, uh, in, in ethnographic engagements and collaborations that um, were unfolding over the last year and a half during my time in China. So one is the story of my colleague and friend Yu Ling San, who is a computer science professor at a big university in Shanghai, who became a pandemic volunteer worker during the Shanghai lockdown in 2022. And the other is a story of Xuan, a young woman who returned, quote unquote, to China's countryside at the onset of the pandemic. So these two women will feature centrally today throughout the talk. And I will begin with Yu Ling's story. So during the 2022 Shanghai lockdown, Yu Ling became a pandemic volunteer worker at her university campus. She and I had stayed in close contact as she was going through this uh, very intense, what was really in the end of three months long period 
um, of volunteer work um, on campus. She, she, was, she stayed on campus. She couldn't leave the campus. She slept in the dormitories. And um, she ended up writing up her autoethnographic experience during this time. And we spent often uh, many hours on the phone, touching base together, also with our collaborator, Yu Chen Chen, who is also here in the audience with us today. Um, and together, the three of us, we're really drawing um, on each of our respective long-term engagements with um, data-driven governance processes and what this meant and how these processes crystallized during the Shanghai lockdown. Um, we'll present these findings actually in the forthcoming publication in Germany in Hamburg next week. And there's a paper that you all can read and I'm happy to share it with you. And here's the citation on the right. So let me give a brief backdrop, since not everyone here in the room or with us on Zoom might be familiar with China's version of COVID management over the last three years. So shortly after the initial outbreak um, in Wuhan, the Chinese Communist Party had implemented what it called the zero COVID strategy. So this was the stated commitment, quote unquote, to eliminate the virus and preventing a public health crisis at all costs. And this is, of course, official government rhetoric. These are Xi Jinping's, President Xi Jinping's words. And so the party state really positioned in this move a data-driven management approach to COVID as a guarantee of public safety and is key to providing normalcy. And what you can see here on the, on the right hand of the screen is, of course, the health QR code system, Qian Kang Ma, which was key to this data-driven approach um, uh, to guarantee uh, zero COVID. So this data-driven approach to zero COVID was really part of a much broader turn towards um, data-driven governance that began with a series of policy, uh, uh, policies since 2015. Um, and this is sort of broadly construed around a move that the government refers to in Chinese as Shu Hua, so a kind of data-driven transformation of the society. And it's really associated with some of China's core political programs as it's declared by the CCP. So data-driven transformation to accomplish China's Made in China 2025 project, which is its upgrade to manufacturing. And more recently, also its upgrades to agricultural industries, often referred to as rural revitalization, which I will talk about more later. And all of this is really presented as key for the nation's future food and technological sovereignty. So we really have to understand that Chiang Kang Ma, the health QR code system, the data-driven approach to managing zero COVID is part of this broader turn towards data by the CCP. Um, so the adoption of the data-driven governance system was then really sort of unfolding through two intertwined systems. On the one hand, as I already mentioned, the implementation of the health QR code system here in the middle, but often the health QR code system, which tracks people's whereabouts and contact traces, um, is understood uh, when we think about AI and data and, and, and COVID management, so from a sort of Western media perspective, as the central toolkit, as an automated toolkit that streamlined these processes through automation, through data mining. What is much less talked about is how much the system relied on a large workforce of volunteer workers, low-level bureaucrats and citizens who operated on the local neighborhood level to really make the healthcare code system work on a day-to-day -day basis, managing testing of citizens and providing data work when the system actually broke down. So for about two years, the system of um, manual labor and partially automated um, health QR code tracking worked really well uh, when many other regions struggled with the continuous rise in COVID cases in 2020 and 21, China moved within the time span of only a few months down to zero COVID related deaths. And this all really sort of was put in, stayed in place until the spread of the new Omicron variants that were much more transmissible. And the spread of these variants arrived in China, started in China at the end of 21, early 2022. So things really began changing then. Uh, sorry, oh, here we go. Let me see if I can move the cursor. I can really see. How about this? I don't see it on your screen. No, I don't have it on my screen, yeah. How about this? Oh, 
Yeah, I can't, I can't, ma I can't manage it in my system, it seems. It, yeah, I don't see it on my screen, so you guys get a different, yeah. Yeah. Okay, sorry for the Zoom participants. We're trying to make sure that the Zoom setting also works for the people in the room. <laughs> um, is it sort of okay like this? Okay. Um, so what you see here on the screen are photographs um, that I took during the early stages when Shanghai moved into its uh, uh, lockdown, which was a citywide lockdown in late March. It had transitioned from partial lockdowns into a full-on lockdown because the city was unable to contain the spread of the new Omicron variants. There was times where there were 20,000 new cases on a daily basis. And this citywide lockdown, even though it was initially announced to only last for one or two weeks, ended up lasting for many citizens and for many districts of Shanghai two to three months. So now I need to move my cursor back here. So Yulings University campus too had gone into lockdown shortly after the official announcement of the citywide lockdown. Uh, uh, the university issued very quickly after this initial announcement a calling for volunteer workers to remain on campus and support the students as the campus was transitioning into this lockdown. Many of the younger faculty members and instructors, including Yulings, stepped up as, as these volunteer workers and um, really sort of implemented um, a transition into something that, that many students on campus and of course citizens writ large received as perceived as something really, really traumatic. So residents were allowed out of their apartments only for um, COVID testing, very few businesses still operated and people struggled to obtain basic necessities like medical supplies or food. And you see some images here from Shanghai from that time. And so citizens like my friend Yuling became so-called volunteer and frontline workers who were tasked with things like the procurement of food, but also campus safety and stability. They performed daily nucleotic acid testing and helped uh, provide food for the students, but also really helped um, enable kind of emotional stability amidst this really sort of stressful period. So the QR code system at this point had completely broken down because the accelerated speed um, of the spread of these new variants was really impossible for the system to keep up with. And so many of these volunteer workers also ended up performing data tracking work as the system itself basically ceased to function. So this is a quote here from one of the colleagues that Yuling was working with who said, most of my time was really spent on repetitive data work. This work was very cumbersome, very time consuming. It made me even dizzy. So I designed a tool. So basically Yuling and her colleagues in the computer science department came together to implement and design a localized data management system that would eventually actually be adopted across the campus as a whole. And that was used for the remainder of the lockdown. So the system was technologically simple, but it was crucial as it produced feelings of stability and order at a time that was really perceived as, as socially dramatic with many citizens expressing increasingly um, anger, frustration, despair, uh, which was often also publicly displayed on social media. And I'm sure many of you have seen this covered by, by news media as well. Um, so this data tool Yuling noted down in her field notes over and over, wasn't just about the advancement of data. It wasn't just about fi providing a technological fix, but it was really about providing warmth and care to the fellow faculty and instructors and, and, and especially the students. And, and here, this is a quote from one of the colleagues in the computer science department who, who sort of emphasizes here how this very tool focused on providing efficiency and optimization was meant to offer care and support. So in turn, this offering of care and support with a technological data-driven solution was really about cultivating an attitude of problem solving, like a positive attitude towards um, the feeling that this kind of broken system um, you know, was difficult to, to uh, bring under control, but that actually the brokenness of the system itself was something that could be fixed by citizens themselves. So both the data work and the other day-to-day -day tasks centered around these productions of positive feelings about a technological solution to a broken system of zero COVID, 
um, was not only about creating a positive sort of sense about how the campus was dealing with the lockdown, but it also really enabled um, Euling's colleagues to help the students see the campus and the city writ large as capable to deal with this moment of crisis. So this was really a crucial form of emotional labor and you see this sort of enacted through various WeChat posts, um, you know, where students um, were um, interacting with the faculty who ended up being volunteer workers, where there was much expression of support and care and optimism um, that enabled then also uh, people to sustain an increasingly difficult uh, to manage uh, situation. And in the end, this also produced good feelings about the government policies of zero COVID in the end itself, in a moment that was um, really perceived as, as a moment of crisis and even feared in terms of um, political instability. So this reminded me a lot of the kind of happiness labor that I had described in my book, Prototype Nation. So happiness labor, as I've theorized it in the book, is really the form of labor that produces feelings of happiness and cheerful delight in the very moment when there might be a growing distrust of technological promise, of systems that are being put in place by corporate or political entities and elites. It's the kind of labor that produces feelings of happiness and optimism and sustains a good feeling about um, systems of control despite a sense of exhaustion, despite a sense of exploitation. So it sustains a good feeling about, about technology. So it was this happiness labor that granted Yuling and her colleagues in the computer science de department a form of what we call in this paper, a circumscribed agency. So these citizens, in other words, produced often ambivalently so positive feelings of happiness, of support and care regarding state policies and mandates in moments of social upheaval. And this was done really through a combination of happiness labor and data work. So in Western media coverage at the time, the measures to shift towards dynamic zero COVID or dynamic zero COVID clearing, as it was often referred to, and the harsh lockdowns that cities like Shanghai experienced in the spring of 2022, um, were really reported as another exemplar of China's all-encompassing technological surveillance state. And really what I've shown so far and what we've described also in this paper is that far from an automated system, however, the maintenance, the maintenance of stability and these COVID controls really relied heavily on various forms of labor and indeed demanded citizen participation, like the kind of happiness labor and, and circumscribed agency I just described. Okay, I now want to transition out of the Shanghai lockdown experience that Yuling and her colleagues um, were documenting and turn towards a different site. China's countryside, which on first glance might seem worlds away from the kind of data-driven governance of Shanghai's zero COVID um, that I just described. And yet, as I will show in what follows, China's countryside and the people who have turned towards it since the pandemic um, are enrolled as yet another crucial actor in China's data engines. So uh, in 2019, uh, the 25-year-old Xian moves from the United States back to China after a college degree um, here, she majored in religion. And upon her return, she works in Shanghai for a while, feels exhausted by the pervasive culture of overwork that is often referred to as Neituan in Chinese or involution, and decides to take a chance and leave Shanghai in a world of exhaustion and overwork behind, moving to a small 20 village, uh, 20 people village in the southeastern province of Guangdong called Tixi. So Tixi is just about three hours drive from the city of Zhuhai. Um, and as you can see um, here, um, one of Xian's projects that she had been working on over the years and that she was proudly presenting when I first made my way to TC Village in December 2021 was a local farmer's market. Uh, it was her brainchild. She had persisted at hosting the event um, despite local government intervention at the last minute who saw it as a major risk um, of the spread of the new variants of COVID. And uh, so you can see some photos here of the farmer's market. Um, and as I was walking with Xian through the farmer's market, she explained to me there's really a business model here. 
Um, she waved at the high rise buildings that are just uh, visible in at the backdrop of the village. So if you turn the other way from the farmer's market, so the farmer's market to the place here, this little area here on the right. So uh, just behind it, you see in the distance, these high rise buildings. And so the business model that Xian and, and the other young um, villagers are following here is to connect farmers, connect young people who move to places like Qixi village, who are committed to sustainability, to eco farming with urban consumers, uh, with urban consumers close by or urban consumers who might come in from the other big cities in Guangdong, like Shenzhen, for instance. So Xian herself is committed to ecological education. She brainstorms with me about how to set up a consultancy of her own that um, would tie design thinking into eco farming. She works together with one of her neighbors who is here depicted, a graduate of Shanghai's elite Fudan University who quit her job as a journalist and made her passion of bird watching into a form of ed um, ecological education. And you see the little school that they built here on the right side. So both Xian and the former Fudan professor while opting out of urbanization are not rejecting modernity. So this is really important to emphasize here. They're building an alternative vision of what it means to be cosmopolitan Chinese in a moment when China was largely closed off to an outside world and many people like Xuan couldn't travel internationally. So when Xuan needs a break from her farm work, she spends time at Rana's coffee shop which doubles as Rana's uh, personal living space. Rana moved to Qixi village a year before Xuan. And like Xuan, she switches fluently between Chinese and English as she brews a coffee. You can see her on the right here. Um, with beans, she explains to me, grown in the southwestern province of Yunnan. And Yunnan really a place that many of the young people I meet in Qixi village describe to me as a kind of prototype, a kind of prototype of Qixi village itself. So Yunnan as the kind of archetype for these kinds of projects. The older villages that I meet throughout my visit, many of whom have never actually left the village, refer to these recent arrivals as new villagers, echoing official state discourse. And you see some of the, I put some screenshots up of the official state course um, that enroll some of these citizen-led initiatives already in the government's project of rural revitalization that I will explain in a, in a little second. So, the, these so-called new villages, in other words, experiment with, but also make money off of what they call alternative ways of food processing. They're just a step away from the big cities and their food eating and making practices here are really kind of whimsical. You can see sort of the aesthetics here and yet they um, scale. A younger generation of temporary visitors frequently flock to these rural sites. You see photos here um, of my time that I spent a little bit later that year. As Shanghai was going through its lockdown, I escaped to Yunnan Dali, um, where these sites, quite similar to Qixi village, but on a much larger scale, became the backdrop uh, to young people's social media um, postings, um, kind of celebrating and selling back to a larger, younger consumer base who is excited about the countryside and sees it, again, as an escape from these kinds of practices of involution and overwork. It is through these transregional networks of localized experiments, however, that various new villages circulate in the name of redefining what their lives should look like. The Chinese phrase of so this is my life, or I define what, what my life should be like, if we want to translate it more freely, repeatedly surfaced across these contexts. So I saw this appear in Guangdong, in Qixi village, but I also saw it repeatedly sort of mentioned in, in Dali and in some other field work I did in Jiangxi province. So when I meet the local government official in charge of Qixi village, he shows me the official party slogans um, of rural revitalization that he had printed on the walls of villager houses just a month before my arrival. He tells me that the new villagers are really a good thing for the village. They spread positive energy or zhengnang liang in Chinese, good feelings about this place, about China's countryside, um, and about rural revitalization, which is a government led initiative more broadly. The work that these new villages perform is often self driven with much idealism and passion. It's a form of happiness labor that produces good feelings about the investment into the countryside that was long portrayed as backwards and as a place that young people actually wanted to leave behind. 
right? So this label is actually really crucial and you can even see the word happiness, um, which of course um, I was very intrigued by all over the village, all the way from the farm into these community spaces in, in the village um, to Rana's coffee house here. So in Tishi village, happiness labor produces good feelings, not only about China's countryside, but also about the government's key policy on rural revitalization. In 2017, President Xi Jinping declares rural revitalization as a national strategy. This was a significant new policy, a move away from decades of a policy called poverty alleviation, which distributed funds to rural China to build up basic infrastructures. So think road development, the setting up of broadband internet. And this project of poverty alleviation had succeeded, she declared in, declared in 2017. And in 2020, there was you know, this notion of there's almost like a victory of poverty alleviation, even though some poverty alleviation projects still um, exist. Taishin Global here stated that China is no longer officially poor. So only a year later, at the height of the global pandemic, new regulations were released that framed data-driven data approaches, so Shu Hua or data-driven transformation of all the industries as the key toolkit also for China's new rural revitalization project. So what I want to draw your attention to here is that the happiness labor I've observed in Tixi really helped reposition the countryside as, a, as worthy of these data-driven investments, as the place where data-driven transformation can happen in future. So importantly, they laid the groundwork for the government's big initiatives to attract not only flows of technology and resources to upgrade agricultural production, but to also attract young talent who would then be implementing these data-driven futures. Okay, I will now offer some concluding thoughts. So I began this talk by arguing that data engines are simultaneously participatory and coercive. And I now want to end by summarizing how what I presented today can us help think about the seeming contradiction. So I've talked about Xuan's attempts to extract herself from a pervasive sense of nature and the sort of involution, overwork, exhaustion in China's big cities. In her search for an alternative way of living, she and the intergenerational group of people that I've met in Qixi village have turned a prior unattractive, uninhabitable part of the hinterlands of Guangdong and its industrial zones into a space of experimentation, a place that's seemingly outside the reach of the state, where people tinker with not only organic farming, but also spirituality. There was much talk about eating while I was there, and I got several eating readings as well. Um, so what they've built in this process here were really prototypes for rural revitalization that the government ended up productively enrolling as, uh, as key examplars for where the country wants to go with this in future. So what I wanna argue here is really that these citizen-led initiatives in China's countryside sit alongside the citizen-led experiments with data-driven alternatives in China's urban spaces, as I've talked about with Yuling's work at the major Shanghai University that were prototyped during the Shanghai lockdown. So in both cases, in Xi'an's case, it's the countryside. In, in Yuling's case, it's the city's population management. Both of these projects are framed as something that's a good thing, as something that is livable, even desirable for, for Chinese citizens, as something that other people could or should emulate. So in other words, these experiments, these prototypes provided the affective infrastructural backdrop for two key government policies that I've mentioned throughout this talk today. So the data-driven farming rural revitalization project that is sort of crystallized in these precision farming experiments at the outskirts of the big cities and the data-driven population management also prototyped in big cities like Shanghai. You can see on the right, a photo that I took in one of these prototypes in Qing'an district in Shanghai, <clears throat> which is um, one of the districts that um, kind of renders visible to citizens what a data-driven population management could mean uh, for citizens who struggle to take care of their elderly, um, access to basic resources in the city. Um, so I argue that both the experiments with zero COVID management that were data-driven and these rural experiments by young people are prototypes that the government enrolls in these big um, statewide um, policies. So paying attention specifically 
to the role of affect in how these sites are being uh, promoted um, and engaged with, I build specifically on the feminist scholar Chia Young's work, who has documented vividly how Chinese governance processes increasingly rely on the production of positive feelings. She says, the pursuit of happiness has become a moral imperative for the quality citizen. So in other words, the CCP, which is most commonly associated with top-down authoritarian control, governs select groups of citizens and during specific moments of crisis, uh, governs its citizens via the production of feelings. So I've shown in this talk, for instance, how a circumscribed agency is assigned to those who produce good feelings about the state and its interventions in a moment of crisis. So I offer data engines then as an analytical frame to help us think about this relationship between the turn towards data-driven technologies and governance that do not begin with a priori frameworks of surveillance and top-down control. So really as an analytical move that pushes back against this reliance on the surveillance state as an explanatory frame. I argue that data engines create an affective bond of mutual interest and positive feeling between the Chinese party state and its citizens. And they perpetuate the party state's claim to be the sole legitimate entity to represent the Chinese people. Data engines is also a move that offers empirical insights into China's shifting governance processes. Um, I argue specifically that the period um, of early 2022 during these intense lockdowns was marked by a widespread adoption of a particular mode of governance that expanded earlier techniques of affective governance, but intertwined them with this promise of, the, of a data-driven future. So this technique of data engine then really reframes the citizen-state relationship via a mindset of data-driven transformation. So the idea that positive societal transformation arises from processes of technologically mediated population management that grants certain freedoms to certain people while restricting others. So data engine does is really a form of control and social management that does not only rely on, but demands citizen participation. And with this, I would like to end. Uh, I really look forward to all your comments. I, as I said in the beginning, the notion of data engines is something that I'm playing with. I'm hoping to potentially turn this into a next book project. So I really look forward to all your comments and to the discussion with you. Thank you so much. Are we moving over here? So I'm gonna unplug the... And the audience now can hear us too? Yes. Great. Right. Okay. And we have questions in the uh, chat that you're going to hand me a key uh, when we want to get to those. Okay. Wow. What an amazing set of observations and insights and, and images and much else. Um, I guess uh, as people, uh, if people are formulating questions, uh, I'll, I'll start with one um, about the the discussion at the end on citizenship. Uh, these are citizen-led initiatives and alternatives. Um, and then your uh, concluding point about how data engines demand citizen participation. And I guess um, in just sort of from a demographic or population level, I mean, is this... Um, is the idea that certain citizens participate in data engines, you know, in, in terms of this discourse on quality sujur, uh, um, you know, is it a is it faculty, college students, it, are we talking about um, a differentiated citizenship uh, in which, um, you know, uh, urban, largely still urban elites are the ones who are uh, engaging in the data engine, or is there, you know, um, something that's more broader and inclusive uh, in, in the idea of citizen participation? Does the party demand participation from these citizens only in this data transformation, or is there a broader vision of, of you know, sort of non-elites, um, uh, uh, migrants, uh, mm -hmm. low-income migrants, I should say, unemployed, um, and, and rural populations uh, that, that aren't kind of in the set of demographics that we saw in the top. Yeah, that's such a great question. Thank you, Mark. So 
what I was really trying to show is that this form of participation that is granted to, as you're saying, yes, select members of China's population is something that is held up as a promise, as something that could be available to the migrant worker if the migrant worker managed to transform themselves into someone who might look like Xuan or might look like Yuling, someone who might yeah. transform themselves into into um, a sort of entrepreneurial type agent who takes right. it upon themselves to either address the breakdown of the data-driven management on the campus or uh, in, you know, participate in sort of the re-engagement with the countryside. So both Yuling and Xuan also are from rural parts of China. They both grew up in the countryside. Um, so they are also um, in some ways fitting that model that the Chinese state has in mind of saying, look, Yes, you can come from a rural part of China and upgrade yourself into someone who is a cosmopolitan Chinese. And you can do that not only actually by going abroad or by being in America, but you can do it here at home. You can do it in China's countryside. You can do it at the Chinese university campus. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, all right, uh, we'll take a question from Jonathan Bach. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you so much, Julia. Um, great to have you. Uh, a couple of things came to mind. One, one is Nancy is one of the earlier speakers um, last semester um, at ICI, um, Wu Kameng, for those of you who know her, um, at Chinese University of Hong Kong. And she was uh, doing research on volunteerism uh, and, uh, and was interested in the way volunteerism. Uh, functions as a space that is both a kind of space for participation and control, right? It's a space that we need and a space that people are going to want to enter the volunteerism and we're looking at volunteers around the Olympics, but also around the helping people with wine, but also forms of, uh, of, 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 of that, that, that meld into protests and problematic issues. So I was wondering if there's too much tension in controlling agency that comes up in, in uh, things that you describe. Um, I'm just going to throw you that all that news. The second thing I was wondering about is about um, the way in which the world is seen through the lens of these individual that you talked about as well as the state. On the one hand, it's trans evaluation where the world is worthy of certain things. But of course, one can also imagine a certain romanticism and that is, is present in that. And that made me wonder also about the role of gender specifically. Um, I mean, the, the little that I know about similar um, situations, um, most of the people in case I'm familiar with are mostly run by women, um, mostly women who have, who have escaped the city in addition and have gone to be in these in rural areas. Um, and there's also a very different gender uh, connotation to hair and happiness. And so I was wondering yeah. what role gender plays in this particular story. And the very last thing is I'm curious to hear you talk a little more about having more on the notes of the data. I was trying to do the about the and data and what's 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 the engine, what's what what is the engine? What is mm. sorry. No, great. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> maybe I'll start with the gender question since that's the one that I've been thinking a lot about. So yes, I think you're exactly right. Um, a lot of this kind of work is carried out by women. And, uh, and that's exactly the point in terms of the kind of warmth, the kinds of care that is meant to be sort of cultivated and created about some of these projects is often assigned to women's labor, is often assigned as some as to women as something that they are naturally better at. And this was something that I observed already when I was studying these tech incubator type spaces earlier, about 10 years ago, right? Where this form of happiness labor to nurture innovation, to make it sustainable because entrepreneurial labor is really hard. It's very precarious. Um, Happiness labor was mostly carried out by women who were employed in these kinds of programs, who made these kinds of very stressful work environments, pitching to investors, um, living on a shoestring budget, making those kinds of work environments 
sustainable and fun for the mostly male entrepreneurs. And it was mostly sometimes young men worked in these kinds of professions, but it was mostly young women. And similarly here across my research sites, um, I've seen mostly women leading these kinds of projects. Um, uh, uh, Yuling actually did a whole uh, study and hopefully she will publish this soon, working with um, the women volunteer workers in the local Xiaochus, in the local neighborhood, Chu uh, Weihui committees. And this is mostly women in their 50s, um, uh, women who are quite active still, they don't work anymore, but they take it upon themselves to kind of take care of the neighborhoods, but also this relationship between care and control is a really fussy one. They also then often enact um, forms of control on behalf of the state or uh, have are, are assigned with quite a bit of power, right? And so um, I wish I could show my slide still because there is actually a recent study of a group of scholars um, at, at Yale um, who are documenting how the pandemic actually shifted some of these local governance processes by assigning the Chi Wei Hoi level entities much more power. And, and so again, so it's an interesting question of the role that women actually play in this. And some of these local experiments that I saw in Shanghai around certain city districts being labeled as prototypes for Shanghai's data-driven city management writ large were also promoted by women. You've seen maybe on the one slide, there was a woman presenting this work, right? Mm -hmm. and, and again, a lot of times these projects are also then talked about in relationship to traditional Chinese medicine. There is like data-driven management that's presented as high efficient presented alongside these other methods of health and care that are often assigned to women as well. So, okay, there were two other questions. Um, should I address them or should we? Sure. Yes, yeah. okay. One was more common just about the volunteers. And I was curious about data engines. Yeah, data yeah. engines. So, I mean, this is, this is gonna be very helpful for me because I'm still playing with this concept. So data engines, so engines in some ways, I, I use that phrase right now because of the CCP sort of obsession kind of with sort of this engineering or drawing kind of from an engineering mindset, right? Sort of the engine, sort of the machinery of data and also trying to show how this is a different project than the American data science project. So data science could be seen as the equivalent to Shu Hua, to sort of this digital data-driven transformation in China. And data science is really making an upgrade in computer science, right? Sort of think chat GPT, right? The next level of computer science, which also stokes much fear about maybe computer science labor itself will be automated away, right? But the, the CCP approach is much, on the one hand, much more conservative because it, it pushes back against this full-on automation, but on the other hand, also more expansive because it applies this data-driven management to all kinds of segments of the population. It's not just about upgrading computer science, which I think is the project in America. It's about upgrading industries, agriculture, and how the relationship between the state and the citizens work. So it's fundamentally really also about the upgrading of governance and the upgrading of bureaucratic work, which is what Xi Jinping, of course, referred to as China's fifth modernization when he came into the office. And he has created direct links between Shu Hua, between data-driven transformation and this China's fifth modernization, which is the upgrade of bureaucracy, which has really sort of intensified during the pandemic, right? And these, and if I could show my slides, I could show you that paper of the colleagues. Um, right. I can circulate it later at, at yeah, at the Yale Law School. Yeah. Right. I saw that. Okay. Uh, yes, Sarinda has a question. And, and, and while we're, uh, let's just remind people online to please uh, drop your questions in chat, right? Thank you. We have a couple that I'll get to in chat in a moment. Sarinda. So it's such fascinating I found your uh, highlighting of the international labor aspect. It was really fascinating because we, we know that the city and capital is subjected by citizens and consumers in all kinds of ways. But your emphasis of that objectification at the American level was really uh, fascinating. Mm -hmm. Like that the citizens should be best equipped, but also should be happy 
and we can start measuring rates, sequentiation, and then we'll go into the works that we have. So it's where it's measurements can be aligned. Um, so, you know, and, and then we need to put a solution that the function. But I'm wondering if we can see that as from the very little that I gather, if we can see that as like we're going in without mentality, mm -hmm. or is that a limited concept? Mm -hmm. If we can see it as such, um, would this then be one of the main techniques of the surveillance state? Mm -hmm. um, and if yes, how do we sort of, um, because we're saying that it's not the surveillance state, it's the yeah. like now. So I'm kind of trying to grapple with how do we, if, if it's a how is that? And if it isn't, what is it that the Holy Government is missing that you'll see in the Russian? Mm. Yes. No, thank you for that. Um, so, Tia Young and some other scholars, including Carol Wallace, who have written about the relationship between affective governance and technology, often come back to Foucault. And um, what I find useful in terms of highlighting here is maybe a Foucauldian, rather than governmentality, a Foucauldian attention to genealogy, right? How certain kinds of modes of control and power reverberate, reappear in kind of twisted and torqued ways in different moments of time. Um, so there's, of course, a whole nother lineage in China studies around experimentation and governance, like Heilman and Perry's book, Mao's Invisible Hand, right? That really sort of discusses how the CCP experiments with a range of government modalities, mixes them quite flexibly together on a need by need basis. And I find that quite appealing. I draw from both frameworks quite a bit to show, um, and this is what I'm hoping to do with data engines too, right? How in certain, in certain moments, for instance, the moment of crisis, the moment of the Shanghai lockdown, the government manages to tighten and restrict control. So in that moment, it draws on a particular kind of vocabulary and a particular kind of technique of governance that is much more top down. And then it can also loosen again, or it loosens at the same time in a different part of China. So this sort of contracting and loosening is something that I'm really interested in, the sort of flexibly drawing on different modes of governance. Sometimes they appear very Foucauldian, sometimes they appear much more sort of authoritarian, right? And it depends what moment you look at, or it depends which population is currently managed, right? And so, so yes, yeah, so there's glimpses of, of these various modalities drawn out at different moments in time. That's how I'm thinking about it. Okay, Monterey and then Vicky. Thank you, Susan. That was a really interesting moment. Actually, my question was very similar to this because the made a choice here regarding what kinds of methods and descriptors to use. And I appreciate on the one hand, you're wanting to push back against an allegorian sense of surveillance state. Um, but I think my, my question was very similar to that. And I, you know, I wonder, I wonder um, if one way of checking would be, does the data governance ever get hindered or stop um, if there isn't happiness affected, you know, if there isn't happiness with the NSA, if it's music data, uh, <laughs> would the data governance ever not take place or slow down? Or is the applicants of the system kind of focused, uh, uh, mm. focused? Mm. That's a great question, yeah. So, so I love where you ended with the question, which was sort of the affect is coping, but I want to start with your earlier comment or how you began to comment. So happiness labor doesn't mean it's all good. Happiness labor, I argue, is a form of exploitation. And it's very hard for us to see that form of exploitation because it exactly is about producing these good feelings. It seems great, you know, everything seems good. You know, the, the campus was managed in a much better way because these um, volunteer workers performed that form of labor, right? And it's very hard for us to notice these things as a form of exploitation. And yes, there is moments, of course, there's moments where data-driven governance breaks down constantly, right? And in fact, this paper that I have with Yu-Chan 
and you link that it's very much about that right is how the system is constantly breaking down how it requires constant maintenance labor the stability needs to be constantly maintained and what was really interesting i was i happened to be in shanghai during the protests was a moment with that this breakdown right and this anger that had built up during this entire Hence, period, right, of lockdown was really sort of coming to the surface, right? I had never experienced this before during my time in, in China since 2006. It was, and it was unclear what would happen, right? It was this, um, I lived very close to Wulumuchilu, and, and so experiencing this sort of almost on a visceral level, how the city changed during these days of protest, of anger, right? And how anger was expressed across generations, across class, was a very, and, and Yu-Chan, Yuling and I were really debating in our write-up to how, how should we, how should we bring the protest into this? Is this a full-on breakdown? Is it a challenge? Is it a form of resistance? Is it a pushback, right? To, to the system, what, how should we theorize that, right? And um, one thing I think that I often, uh, fall back onto is you know classical sort of theories of resistance offer very little because it's 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 seldom that we learn much about resistance in China if you just think about sort of this tearing down the system kind of mentality of counterculture because resistance is something that often happens through a kind of James C. Scott weapons of the weak kind of modality dragging your feet you know but the protests in Shanghai of course were much more sort of outspoken criticism of of the government, right? So we could we could see it as actually a breakdown of this affective bond that was rebuilt though, right, in many ways. And I think in, we could theorize, you know, the opening up of China and this is debated, right? Was the opening up later a response to the protests or not, right? right? Yeah, thanks for this question, yeah. Vicky, Vicky Adam, yes. Thanks for another great talk. Um, I want to push a little harder on happiness. Um, so I really appreciate your kind of thinking and the sort of media frenzy of this demonization of China as an authoritarian state. But by the end of the talk, I worry that you offer a softer account of the demonization, but not really open up. A sort of full range of, um, or as full as possible range of political possibilities, I guess. And so that connects to the issue of the protests. Um, so if happiness is in the end reduced to a, another form of exploitation, another form of governmentality and of control, I don't feel like that is opens the range enough. And the protest mm -hmm. seems to me. Um, so, so another way to put that is across the three cases, is there any variation in, is the rural data engine different to mm. the other ones? Um, and just are there, is it a soft, is it, is it just a soft um, authoritarianism or something more than that? A very difficult question yeah i i think uh one of the and this maybe came out of the last one year and a half in china um i do see this form of governance as a as not one that is of less control or um or sort of more benevolent or uh, sort of softer than the framing of authoritarianism. In some ways, I find it almost worse because it operates through something that is very hard to notice as control. And because it operates through these sort of highly selective, but yet forms of participation that are promised, it can easily slide into coercion and you never quite know when that happens. And that's why I think the surveillance state rhetoric is so misplaced because it doesn't help us understand. It's a Western centric frame. It doesn't help us understand how control in China actually operates. 
I don't mean to say that there is no control in China. I mean to say it operates differently than how we think about it. And it's actually quite intense and very power, like it, it, it seeps into so many corners of people's lives. And I've seen it reach very remote corners of China. You know, in my past research, I hadn't really traveled to rural parts as much. I'd been at sort of rural industrialized sort of zones in Guangdong, right? But I hadn't been in Jiangxi or Yunnan in these kinds of very remote places. And um, I was I was rereading James C. Scott, you know, the Somia sort of theorization of how certain agricultural practices and 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 you know other forms of um, uh, sort of practices at the at sort of the borderlands escape the reach of the state. And my question was, is there still such an escape? And in fact, many people come to Yunnan, for instance, or to TC village as a form of escape, they talk about it. And I think escape is not the right term either for this, you know, because escape again has this sort of binary, right? So this is why these older framings are not quite useful here because it's not the state versus the citizen. There's much complicity, there's much co-production, right? And that's really what I'm drawing attention to. Now, this is not to say that everything is lost and we just need to be pessimistic now, you know, there's no hope and there's no moment, there's no opportunity for pushback. I think there is much pushback in these forms of participation, but we need to really look at them. We need to notice them quite differently because they often also, the same way sort of happiness, labor, and these kinds of practices don't look like exploitation. These forms of citizen participation or circumscribed agency, they don't look like resistance, right? And we easily just sort of judge them as like, oh, people are just, you know, they, they're sold out or like they are co-opted, right? And I want to push back against that too and say, no, that's too simple. You know, people are very critical and I met a lot of people who were, you know, taking issue with what the government is doing. So, yes, but let's talk more about this later too. <laughs> Great. Okay, we have a question in the back and then we have um, so my question is on what is the power dynamic in this data driven farming infrastructure and does this system augment the current rural urban polarity in China that is happening already for a long time and then it will be very helpful to elaborate this question in terms of forms of surveillance from education to surveillance technology. Okay, great. Yeah, these are very big questions. So I think is data engines, and I think what I'm hearing in your question, and correct me if I'm wrong, is is data engines a technique that sort of intensifies this polarization between rural urban, uh, or is it breaking with that? Is that is that am I understanding correctly? Um, um, so I think it's more uh, a question actually just on overall this um this uh, intervention that you're talking about, is this in general a form that continuously augment the current rural urban polarity in China? Because when you're trying to implement a system that might be working in the urban area into the educational level of the rural people in China, that might not work out without a certain degree of explanation or uh, or maybe from the beginning, like maybe when you look into this, uh, this information into uh, in depth, is it like a form of gentrification, or it's a form that uh, mm. that um has is that uh, or that's like a form that actually has a lot of like design research that is involved. Mm. So I'm just curious, and uh, I would like to hear a bit more. I I understand. Thank you. Yes. No, it's a great question. So, um. Maybe I can tackle this question by talking about um, the circulation of some of these younger people who started out in China cities and then decided to go to the countryside because in many ways, they're the ones who are attempting to translate between and they are receiving at times pushback right to say like some of the villagers, you know, saying, well, I'm not really fully understanding what these new villages are doing or how does this apply to me right so um so these new villages though 
in how they talk about it, they're very concerned with that. They're like, no, we want to take, and many of them even have degrees in anthropology, right? Or design thinking where they are trained to understand and be empathetic with people who they meet, right? So their um, attempt is to engage very seriously with the local cultures, right? And, and but it often, there's much friction though at the same time between, because not everything as you are saying, right? Translates very smoothly between. Um, I would say uh, the government is much less concerned, I think, with does this really translate well? There is a little bit of a brute force kind of approach there in terms of what I see. And it's sort of left in people are kind of left to their own devices. So I spent much time in Jiangxi, which I didn't really talk about today with one female entrepreneur who went back to her home village. So she had a career in banking, her husband works at Huawei, and she decided to go back to that village and set up a um, an orange farm that is partially data-driven, but she also has a, a place where I stayed with her where people gather from Shanghai and Zhenzhen, and it's, it's kind of a, a place where people from these big cities go to be in touch with nature, to experience a very different part of China. And she sells it very much so as this kind of like a, a reinventing of how you live. And uh, she is now, she showed me very proudly, her name is now the first woman's name added to the lineage on the local temple, on her family's temple. So she's, her dad is a government, used to be a government official before he retired, right? So it's a political, particular kind of standing, but her project is very much so enrolled and integrated into that village where she came from. But she feels quite isolated, right? So I think she's in that sense quite successful, but she complained bitterly of how there's, she's the only one, right? And she often feels quite lonely in what she's doing. She's like four hours driving from Ganzhou, so it, it is very remote, right? So I hope, I hope that answered it a little bit. Okay, Na had a question. She's done a lot of work on data-driven shoe production. <laughs> And my question, I also look into the rural regions and also looking into rural revitalization. And this term, it was definitely more highlighted to understand this uh, uh, area in the technology driven uh, approach into rural elements. But before that, I think there are three rural issues. And yeah. uh, evangelization is well known and transformative issues that we look over and over again. And because I think the discussions on agriculture and farmers and also the regions of the rural region, those three issues are would the changes are transforming in these stages. On the way that all actually he looks closely on how tourists. And in this sense, that when you are talking about people going back, which is more entrepreneurship mm -hmm. or uh, higher education, mm -hmm. people going back to rural. And in my book, we're looking at production relocations, mm -hmm. which actually the, the, the workers are moving back from urban mm -hmm. to rural. I think there's a, a very intense uh, transition with the identity mm. of how what is usual. Mm. And, and, and in urban studies, we talk about this duality, state of duality mm. between urban and rural, the call side of innovation, industrialization, but also it is also about political system mm -hmm. and land policy. And but but I think with some case is really is to to I mean to me is my question is how do you see this this transforming uh, state of looking at what is the identity of rural and or whether this kind of urban similar like sub uh, suburban like agriculture regions and like how how it is transforming or what is the relationship or how the relationship is developing 
Yeah, thank you. And I, I, I'm so excited to read your dissertation on this topic, because I do think there is this, uh, you know, what you're studying sits alongside these projects that I've seen over the last year and a half, right, in terms of um, the return of, of migrant workers or the attraction of particular kind of workers in production, right? So this question of rural identity and what is the rural, I mean, it's it's such a complex one in China because it's it varies so much based on where you go. And it's it's such a long held question, right? It's so deeply intertwined with the legitimate, the legitimacy of the Communist Party. Um, and so I think that's fundamentally what's at stake right now. That's how I see it, you know, in this very moment of geopolitical tension, this this sort of um, this, this emphasis on sovereignty, on what is happening in China's inlands and hinterlands, right, and investing in that um, is once again, it's all about the legitimacy of both Xi and, and, the, and the Communist Party. And so that, I think we have to look at that when we think about what makes the rural, right? Because um, it's also what makes the party in some ways. And so I think, I think I do, I did hear you maybe ask another part of this question though, or maybe another aspect of this question is also, can we, you know, maybe there is like a rural studies domain that's now needed, right? Or something like that, or that in a new form, right? I mean, uh, for instance, in our field of human computer interaction, there is now much attention to rural computing. There's like a whole subfield now of rural computing, right? People who conduct research in, in America and in India, all over the world, basically, you know, Bill Gates being like the largest farm landowner in America, right? So these kinds of reinvestments in agriculture happening across sites, right? So we could obviously think, especially given our the Institute, you know, in your China Institute, like what is this sort of transnational question of this? How is this happening in across places, but then also takes some particular forms and shapes. And, you know, I've, I mean, the kinds of rural sites that I was in from Yunnan or Jiangxi, outside outskirts of Shanghai, Guangdong, they're vastly different. Like Yunnan relies heavily on a tourist industry. As you were saying earlier, policy has, has been focused on that, right? San Nongwenti also, sort of these kinds of challenging challenges that are resurfacing in these debates, right? Yunnan was really heavily affected by the Shanghai lockdown because people couldn't travel, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so people were complaining bitterly with us about not having enough income now, right? So I think, so anyway, so I, I'm not sure if I have like a fully formed answer to your question, but I think. Hopefully, you know, some of these directions, I think, both in terms of how certain older projects are reactivated in this current moment, that's about national sovereignty, right, it's really important to look at, and even these sort of questions about <clears throat> China fighting over leadership and who is going to define what the future of national food security or sovereignty looks like in comparison to the United States might be an interesting area. <laughs> yeah. Great, thanks. Let me just read a couple of, okay. uh, of the questions that have been offered by those joining online, and then we have a few more uh, in, the, yeah. in the room. Um, and one of these I'll start with is a, a very much a follow-up, um, and maybe you, know, you can either pass on it because you just answered it primarily or, the, or elaborate, but um, anonymous attendee, uh, could you talk more about the role of data in rural revitalization? Does it live mostly in modernizing enterprises and making them more efficient? Or does it extend to land stewardship itself? In other words, what sort of agriculture, i.e. industrial, like the tomato industrial, yeah. sustainable, is being promoted as compatible with this data-driven approach? Um, and has the state taken a position? I'm sure it has, <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> Did you wanna read another one or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can read, okay, okay, so that's one. And then um, this is from Tunin Sia, uh, who, said, who asks, um, we, we, we touched upon this a little bit earlier. Uh, how sustainable are these positive feelings? Do you have examples of the interaction between citizens who created prototypes and the state? What is the essence of the dynamic between the two? Uh, I guess that's the citizens and the state. Um, maybe that gets back to the, the protest. And then the third uh, and final is um, drawing from my experiences in India, Responses to data are still shaped by the cultures of bureaucratic work in regions with a, a gaping divide between the bureaucratic and civil society responses are mostly I would argue asymmetric. 
Whereas regions with more democratic cultures of work be a more participatory engagement with data in shaping response. What have your observations been in relation to data engines and their place in shaping state institutions, policy, mm, and response? Okay. Okay, three uh, great questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me start with the last one and then make my yeah. way through. Um, so I do think or that's at least something that I find particularly interesting is how data engines, I think, is fundamentally aimed at updating bureaucracy. Right. Yeah. I think that's really a key a key project uh, by Xi Jinping and the CCP, and it's been something that they wanted to do for a long time. And the pandemic has sort of um, intensified that, pushed pushed that forward, allowed for that to happen in 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 much more concrete ways. And um, and again, I've seen this mostly being sort of. Um, experimented with, I guess, in these sort of Shanghai neighborhoods, the Shanghai lockdown, but also in these local districts um, that I spent time in. And so maybe this comes back to the first question, actually. So one thing that I think is very key to understanding these data-driven um, projects in China is that they are often a collaboration between universities, state-owned enterprises, um, and uh, local government entities. Um, and my colleague and friend, Yu Ling Sun, who works in the in a computer science department, um, for instance, works very closely with um, state-owned enterprises um, for implementing and, and kind of experimenting with a variety of these data-driven initiatives, for instance, around elderly care, because that's such a big project, right? So there's a series of laboratories, you might say, living laboratories in Shanghai that apply automation and data-driven techniques to, to elderly care. These are elderly care homes who um, draw from a range of sort of data tracking systems, um, while still also relying on manual care labor often performed by women in their 50s. So I think that's a concrete example of such a prototype, a kind of a living prototype. And, and it's often that these university departments are charged with implementing these on behalf of the university. Um, so maybe that answered actually all three okay. questions in some ways. Yeah, yeah. is that fair? <laughs> yeah, so we have a question in the audience. Hi, uh, in the talk, I find the point on uh, yeah, happiness or positive energy or so mm -hmm. um, on your association of emotional labor. I find it interesting um, because I never, I never thought of it that way because we've heard about this phrase for the past maybe 10 years just everywhere. But because it's a part of the visual and just being part of the propaganda, it's a tagline, it's a tax phrase. It's something that's obviously good to appeal to and so has all the other possibilities that's in a way a Google full surveillance or censorship that also uh, in effect affects how data or information is generated and how knowledge is. Um, developed and disseminated because it's all in control of the public view. Everything has to be like that. Um, but no one actually has to feel that way. So that's why I've never gone to it in, in terms of an emotional favor because, like, no one really buys it in terms of that. It's more about how it legitimizes or makes sense of the um, other parts of the regime, the strategy. And so in terms of your project, your research, um, I'm wondering who's actually happy from this project. Is it a politician? <laughs> or real estate companies that obviously invested? Hmm. Or are the farmers? Because I also know that this CG project uh, in 2017, 16 or 17, I went through a heavy um, 
uh, like overuse of pesticides. And so mm -hmm. perhaps it's also a way to uh, revive to the agricultural, the, the, the land, the soil itself by having more income streams. Um, so maybe farmers are happy. Are they happy? Or <laughs> are, is it a cosmopolitan Chinese use? Are they truly really happy to leave the old system and come to a new one, which is still under the same regime? Mm -hmm. And how is the collection of data benefiting the data engine contributing to whoever's happiness in terms of mm -hmm. what exactly are the data being collected? How is the process used mm -hmm. and for who? Yeah, thank you. And I think it builds a little bit on Vicky's earlier question, right? Is this um, in terms of uh, happiness as a site of control? Um, so happiness is a very elusive concept. Um, I draw a lot on the philosopher and critical race theorist, uh, Sarah Ahmed's work here. She has a book called The Promise of Happiness. I highly recommend it. I, I use it quite a bit in my prototype nation book for this theorization of happiness labor. And Sarah Ahmed really talks about uh, the role that something like the promise of the good life, the promise of happiness plays in controlling people. So you can think of a classical example being the American dream. The American dream is promising people that a middle-class life, a happy life, a house, a car, a good job is something that is achievable is something that is, if you work hard, doable for anyone. And Sarah Ahmed, alongside other scholars like Lauren Berlan, for instance, have shown how this promise of a good life, this promise of happiness remains unachievable for most people. And in that sense, it becomes a kind of cruel form of optimism. So Lauren Berlan calls it cruel optimism. And uh, it's a particular mode of control right because it operates through stoking kind of feelings it's it's through promise rather than actual lived experience and people keep accepting precarious conditions of work exactly because they're like well but if i just work hard enough now maybe if i accept these kinds of conditions now in future i will be granted a good life in future i will be granted happiness so it's this continuous postponement of the actual arrival of the good life uh, that makes this kind of an exploitative process. And so I show how very similar processes to what Sarah Ahmed and Lauren Berland were documenting mostly in sort of a Western century context, how that is being very strategically used by the CCP. Zheng Nong Liang was actually a citizen term that was used online that the CCP later appropriated. Uh. So yes, it's now become this kind of stale kind of notion that many people make fun of, you know, it's similar to kind of nature and where people sort of invoke it sometimes sarcastically, right? Um, because people, of course, are not stupid. They know that a lot of this is not in their reach, right? Um, so I spent quite a bit of time talking also with DD drivers when I was in Shanghai and there's much bitterness of, there's much awareness of how cruel this postponement of the good life for many of them is. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vicky? Uh, I think we can. Oh, so. we, we, did you did you have uh, a question yeah. earlier? Yeah. Thanks so much. The interesting part is all the contradiction that you start to bring up. Um, and I have lots of questions, but one I really wanted to ask is about the infrastructure of technology. Right? So uh, in urban areas, it's been this great system for a while. And I was pretty Yes. Which laid the foundation of this thing uh, called data entry, right? So you know, I'm curious how that is there uh, on the market in rural areas? Uh, you know, is there an infrastructure mm. of technology? Because the contradiction is these young women or other child migrants were able to stay away from urban precisely because of. TikTok and WeChat, all the social media that they continue to reach um, customers for, right? Yeah. CUCLD, whatever. Um, but is it, are they just relying on these, you know, patterns provided, you know, singular um, station or singular points technology? Or is there an infrastructure of technology that's starting to 
controls the border area, which is more much more state driven, right? To look at urban areas, very much controlled by this state, yeah. Um, so maybe I did have a whole slide on the grid management, but it's so complex to explain. <laughs> I didn't, I sort of cut that out, but I, I can maybe show you later. So the grid management, of course, was crucial for um, the Shang during the Shanghai lockdown, during the partial lockdowns. And I think it's such a great example to show how much of this wasn't just via data driven sort of tracking technologies, but relied on these earlier population management strategies right this is sort of the grid management is sort of dividing a big city like shanghai into small grid like structures all the way down to like my street level or my building right or even in the context of the university campus my dormitory right <clears throat> and volunteer workers for instance during the lockdown became responsible for managing these various small scale grid like entities and it was so, so it's so in the paper that I have with Yu Chen and Yuling, we talk exactly about how much of the data work became about interfacing that grid level management system with other government level entities during the lockdown. So it was very crucial. So your question about what this looks like in the rural part. So, I mean, I haven't seen anything like this in rural part. In, in fact, many people who I met in Yunnan, for instance, told me, that it was so great to be in Yunnan during throughout the pandemic because there didn't exist this kind of grid level managed system, at least not in terms of how they perceive that, right? So yes, the villages, for instance, even the village where I live, um, experienced sort of partial sort of informal lockdowns, but there was not that same kind of level of oversight or formalized structure in place. Um, so that, that at least how people were describing it to me, it didn't quite exist the same way. Now your question about are there sort of new technological systems that people come up with that are existing outside of sort of the official systems of maybe Xiaohongshu or like Tencent or... Um, so, I mean, Yunnan was interesting because Dali, I felt like I'm like 10 years back with my old research in hacker spaces because uh -huh. there were a lot of young hackers in Dali, like Web3 enthusiasts. Uh, crypto people who organized raves and talked about drugs and um, identified with setting up alternative kinds of technologies. And they did find Dali to be a place of temporary refuge. So they described it to me as this is a place that is currently still far enough away from the state where they can experiment with these things. So yes, so they were experimenting with alternative structures that are declared by the government illegal, right? Web3 is not a thing that's officially allowed. So that would be an example of this, I think. Okay, I think that's a great note to end on. This, <laughs> uh, this generation um, that, that you're talking about um, and, and their, their worldviews and their their happiness and their <laughs> coercion and their participation, I think is really going to be pivotal to the political future of China in ways that those of us who pay too much attention to the Politburo Standing Committee or the elites or these political <laughs> institutions, I mean, <laughs> surprising things happen all, all periodically in China, politically, and no one predicted them. And I think that you've got your, 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 uh, research focus on an area that is, it has a great deal of, of political you know, volatility and potential um, that, that a few people have written about. But I think this is uh, really fascinating from, from my political science point of view. So with that, let's give a, a great hand of gratitude. For Thank, you. Thank you so much for these wonderful questions. They, they were super helpful. And please email me or reach out. Also, people online, I, I might have not addressed every question. Uh, please don't hesitate to email me. Thank you. That's so great. Thank you.